Hi everyone, my name is Nate Nethercott. I'm going into my fourth year at Queen's University for Engineering Mathematics and Applied Mechanics. And today I'm going to be talking a bit about the research I've been working on for the past few months, which was to implement permafrost feedback into an energy balance model. Over the past decade, reports of a warming Arctic and the repercussions this could have on ecology and human activities have been increasing in their frequency. If we hope to put measures in place to mitigate these climate changes, it will be necessary to develop a comprehensive understanding of the dynamics involved so that we can figure out what changes will need to be made. The Energy Balance Model, or EBM, implemented by Dortmans, Langford, and Wilms in their paper An Energy Balance Model for Paleoclimate Transitions, builds a mathematical framework for many underlying processes which drive the evolution of climate systems. Originally, it was applied to study bifurcations in paleoclimate transitions, such as the onset of the Ice Age, but now it is being used to project into the future. The EBM simply consists of a surface slab which is partitioned into sea and land and an atmosphere slab. By prescribing the model with forcing parameters like carbon dioxide levels and modeling the energy balance of the system, you are able to understand how this climate model will evolve. We're particularly interested in features known as equilibrium points, which, as their name suggests, are when the system does not change with time. If the equilibrium point is stable, you can think of it as a state which the system tends towards. An example of this would be watching the motion of a pendulum and noticing that it sways closer and closer to the bottom as time goes on. In the context of climate systems and the EBM, an equilibrium point is when the temperature of the climate system no longer changes with time. By modifying our forcing parameters, however, we effectively shift this equilibrium to some new value. Activities such as burning of fossil fuels and the melting of glaciers are examples of this, and we know that their effect on climate is to increase temperatures. It would be really convenient for us if modifying these forcing parameters only changed the temperature of the Arctic slightly. That way, we could, in theory, reverse the effects of climate change by reducing our emissions and other pollution. But as it was shown by Dortmans, Langford, and Wilms, there exists a special equilibrium point in the climate dynamics after which a tiny change in the forcing parameters causes a large leap in stability. This is known as a bifurcation, and they play out in real life in the form of abrupt climate changes. The Ice Age, for instance, was argued to be a bifurcation from a warm equilibrium to a cold equilibrium state. In our day and age, we're worried about going in the other direction. Earlier applications of the EBM show that such a bifurcation is entirely possible, at least characteristically, in our future. Using projections for heat transport and greenhouse gas emissions in a scenario where no mitigation efforts are taken, the EBM reports a bifurcation in which Arctic temperatures increase by tens of degrees Celsius. The work I'm discussing today sets out to add more robustness to this earlier model by capturing the effects of permafrost feedback. Permafrost feedback can be understood as follows. Perennially frozen soils contain massive amounts of carbon which become more and more susceptible to thaw as global temperatures rise. Carbon released from these soils increases the atmospheric greenhouse gas burden, which in turn accelerates the warming process and results in further carbon losses. In other words, my research captures a snowball effect exhibited in the Arctic where permafrost thaw acts as a positive feedback source to amplify warming processes. Using the one-dimensional heat equation to model heat conduction in permafrost soils, the governing equations of the energy balance model were modified to account for permafrost feedback. As we are primarily interested in the equilibrium solutions to our dynamics, we use steady state assumptions in our modeling. Within the land section, we define an initial mass distribution of the carbon in different soil varieties and decomposition pools using estimates obtained from literature, and we capture the temperature dependence of microbial decay processes using a Q10 sensitivity. We also split the surface section into 30 levels in order to discretize our dynamics, and we solve them using third-order Runcutta and Adams Bashforth methods. The global atmospheric CO2 and methane burdens were partitioned into anthropogenic and permafrost borne sources. There currently exists projection data for the former, which was published by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it details four distinct emission scenarios. As I mentioned already, the original energy balance model predicted a bifurcation in the scenario where no mitigation efforts were taken. It was my primary interest to see how the timing of this event would be affected by the inclusion of a positive feedback process. After constructing the numerical model in MATLAB, collecting relevant data from literature for prescribing model parameters, and finally simulating the dynamics, we find that permafrost feedback advances the bifurcation by only two years. At the point of bifurcation, around 6.7% of the total carbon has been released. This corresponds to around 74 petagrams, or 74 billion metric tons. 
By the year 2300, we find that 17.5% of the total paraffin has been lost. We also find that in one mitigation scenario, permafrost feedback results in Arctic surface temperatures, which are nearly a degree Celsius hotter than in simulations run without permafrost considerations. Working on this project has made me acutely aware of just how fragile climate systems can be. If we keep on in the direction we're headed, a bifurcation of the Arctic climate to a warm equilibrium state could be in our future. I think I speak for everyone when I say this would be a very, very, very bad thing.